Welcome to the Invested Dads Podcast, simplifying financial topics so that you can take action and make your financial situation better, helping you to understand the current world of financial planning and investments. Here are your hosts, Josh Robb and Austin Wilson. All right. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome back to the Investor Dads Podcast, the podcast where we take you on a journey to better your financial future today. You're giving you all the tips on building the perfect bulletproof 2022 portfolio. Oh boy, my compliance ears are ringing. Are you sure we're able to do this? No, but Chief Compliance Officer Josh, this is what I'm going to say to cover ourselves. Okay. Nothing we talk about in this episode is a recommendation. Please talk to your advisor before making any investment decisions. Each investor's situation, it's completely different. Okay. But I think I've covered us. I feel better. We're good now. Yes. So yeah, that's what we're doing. All right. So we know exactly what's going to happen this year, don't we? I do. Yes. You don't. I do not. No. Yeah. So actually, I don't even know that. You don't know that. No No investment professional does. And really, if anyone claims that they do, you should probably run away from them. Yes. Because they are very much trying to take your money. Yes. (laughs) A better approach to that is... In order to be a bulletproof portfolio for 2022, we just need to look at some potential situations and sure. talk through them. Yes. All right. So I'm going to throw out some hypothetical scenarios, some questions, and then you give me your portfolio thoughts on if something like this would happen, right. what you think or you suggest would be a beneficial allocation. And Absolutely. Again, nothing here is a recommendation, just throw through some hypothetical scenarios. Okay, let's go. Let's start with inflation because that's been in the news. Seven we had, handle. Yeah, seven percent, and that's the biggest we've seen since almost forty years. Forty now. years. Okay. Eighty-two, I think. Man, even older than you. Older than me. <laughs> so let's start with inflation being high where it's okay. been. Okay. So we saw seven percent last year. What if inflation stays stays up? What do you got? Okay. Yeah. So bond prices mm-hmm. are going to fall because people are going to sell them. Okay. So speaking of fixed income in general, it's fixed income. That's what it is. Yep. Well, a fixed level of income during an inflationary environment, very unattractive, yep. right? Because if I'm getting a set payment of, let's say, 2%, yep. but inflation is 7 I'm losing some... Uh, your purchasing money. power goes down. Yes. You're not even covering your in the increasing costs. Yep. So this is what's causing rates to rise, the selling of bonds, because the price goes down, right? And the inverse, right? Yes, so it's an inverse. To, uh, so bonds, in general, in an inflationary environment, are going to do poorly. That yep. on a price perspective, price. Yep. although they're less volatile than stocks, they still will do rather poorly okay. and comparatively poorly. So stocks, mm-hmm. flipping the page, that are going to do well in an inflationary environment, I'm thinking of specifically financials, okay. so banks mm-hmm. specifically, are going to earn more interest income. But also really any company that has pricing power to pass along price increases, as their cost is going to increase, is going to be something that's going to do well as well. Materials companies are ones that come to mind. So like if they're in the materials business, they're receiving cost increases. It's just understood that they're going to be able to pass that along. Oil companies are in a similar situation, but also companies with a clear or perceived like niche or advantage there. So I'm thinking like Apple and iPhones is one example. They could increase their iPhone cost by $50 and okay, people are still going to buy them. Tesla's the same thing. They could put a couple extra thousand on the price press of a Model S and is really anyone going to blink? Probably not. Google. Google can increase advertising costs because they you own the advertising yeah. world. Yep. So those companies with the advantages, I think, are going to be not really too disadvantaged in an inflationary environment. Consumers aren't necessarily even going to pay a sl- or They're not even going to worry about paying a slightly higher price on things that they really, really love. So that's a key there. I also think of companies that don't have a great deal of cost of goods sold, so like software companies, their costs aren't really going up all that much, maybe on the labor side a little bit. So Um, service industries. Exactly. So they may have some margin buffer there to to do okay. Okay. All right. So what if we go the other way? Inflation slows, goes down. So it cools. Yes. A little little hot right now. See if it cools a little bit. Well, bonds are going to become relatively more attractive. So that means people are going to buy bonds because the fixed nature of that income, it's not going to be as bad in a low inflation environment, especially if if you get to the point where those yields get to be at or above inflation as they had been for a while, mm-hmm. that all of a sudden becomes okay. on the table as an option. Mm-hmm. So this is actually going to cause interest rates to fall and then bonds 
may generate some positive return. Okay. Now that's on a price basis. Now if you had factor in yield, yeah, that's even more. Now last year, bonds, kind of the general bond market was down. Yes. Uh, because, because rates were It happened that you said, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Yep. Okay. So flip the page to stocks as well. Inflation cooling. So when interest rates fall. That's generally speaking okay for stocks. It's pretty good for stocks. This is because interest rates are generally used as the discount rates for future earnings, dividends, cash flows. And the lower that rate, the more the future earnings are worth and the more the people are willing to pay for them. So while low and falling rates are good for stocks in general, they're even better for growth stocks. So I'm thinking of things like tech. Tech is something that should do really well because they're a little bit growthier in this environment. Any high multiple growth stocks are going to be more favored in a falling or low interest rate world, but it is going to be worse for things like financials because the interest they earn on that interest income is going to be lower. Even energy is a lower multiple kind of part of the market. It's going to be less favored in a falling rate environment. And I always get confused on these things as I think through them. Is inflation a leading indicator for the economy or a lagging indicator? I don't remember, but the reason I'm asking is like you're talking about some of these sectors doing well or not doing well. Well, I'm wondering, by the time you find out what inflation is, because that's delayed, I know that report yeah. is delayed, yeah. you've already had whatever happened to these companies. So it's not like you can try to play this ahead of time, because yeah, by the time bit, they tell you what inflation is, yeah. you've already experienced whatever that was. It's a little bit lagging. So this is really like, if, if you think very strongly, or you feel really strongly that inflation is going to be really hot or really cool, like that's where far enough ahead, then that is where you would make your position so that you capture that. But we're, we just got, uh, you know, not that long ago, a month before that, inflation readings. Yeah. And by the time you get that, it's two months out from when it actually happened. So and you can't really react to it. Exactly. Okay. Gotcha. So this is not necessarily a time to be reactionary. Yeah, but these are what could happen based on those two things. Exactly. Perfect. So, yeah, that's kind of what I think about inflation. Let's move on to the U.S. dollar. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes the dollar in comparison to other currencies can go up or down in yep. value. Yep. So if the dollar strengthens, what do we got? So yes, if the dollar strengthens relative to, we usually use the DXY basket of dollar, it's compared to a basket of other currencies relative to the dollar. So if the dollar strengthens compared to the other basket of currencies, that could be due to rising interest rates causing US investment to become more attractive, our economic recovery being perceived as stronger than others. If that happens, then international stocks, international equities are going to continue to face a headwind because our dollar is pretty strong right now. Mm as that strong dollar makes profits and sales translated into their home currency from dollars worth less. Okay. So that's not good for international stocks, a strong dollar. And then flip it. Inverse. Weaker dollar. So weaker dollar could be due to falling interest rates, slowing yep. U.S. growth. That would be actually a tailwind for international equities because that foreign revenue is actually worth more. The dollar revenue is worth more when converted back to the nominal currency. And what we've been experiencing, like you said, is a strong dollar. The we've dollar had has a been strong strengthening dollar. over yeah. a handful of years. And that's been something that's been a headwind for international stocks. And I think every year, if someone is always like, you know, hey, this is the year for international. Is that it? From the US. Well, your, your bet last year was that yeah. emerging markets and international would do well. Did that happen? No. It did not. It was not good. Because. Well, EM is a whole other topic. We're going to get to that. Yes. But. The, the dollar strengthening has played a factor in that. Mm-hmm. If you look at international, specifically international developed stocks, they do trade at a comparatively cheap valuation. Yes. So what you're getting for what you're paying mm-hmm. is much cheaper than it is in the U.S. Yep. They're in very different economic situations over there, different growth situations, yep. but the value investor in some people says, oh man, it's the year for international because they're so cheap. But we've been saying that for a long time, and the U.S. has continued to outperform international. So at some point, that will ring true. We point. just don't know when. Yeah. All right. You mentioned emerging markets. So what about emerging markets when it comes to building this portfolio? Well, there's a lot of uncertainties, and much of it is actually tied to current or to COVID response. So COVID zero policies are terrible mm-hmm. for growth. So China has had a notable COVID zero policy. So they went from COVID-19 to COVID zero. Yeah, they, just, they took all 19 the numbers off out. the table. All the numbers are Yeah, out. so their COVID zero policy pretty much says they're shutting down cities and yeah. zero areas tests. of the economy. No, no COVID. If you get like one test, you're shutting down a port, which is terrible. Yeah. 
So that is weighing on China's growth, and China's the biggest part of emerging markets in general. I also just have to note the Chinese government has been very oppressive to business and innovation, specifically over the last year or so. And they, that could go they either way. In a mood. They could they could clamp down worse mm -hmm. on things, or they could say, hey, what we've done is really not working, and we need to open yeah. things back up again. It could go either way. There's a lot of uncertainty there. A kind of flyer in the emerging market world is India. Mm -hmm. India has almost as many people, not almost, but it's growing faster than China in terms of people. Yeah. And they will overtake China in terms of yeah. people. It, they are growing China. their middle class as well. If they get their COVID response in order, that growth is undeniable. But really, the play on emerging markets in general is all about growth. Mm -hmm. If you get the growth in people, you're going to get the growth in spending eventually once COVID is behind you. But getting COVID behind you seems to be hard. Yeah. Okay. Let's do a, a quick break for dad joke of the week. Oh, right. I'm ready. All right. Austin, do you know why I hate elevators? No, I do not, because they get stuck all the time. Well, that's around our office. <laughs> uh, no, but half the time, they're always up to something. Uh, the other half, they're just bringing you down. Bringing you down, man. So I really need to start taking steps to avoid them. Taking steps to avoid them. That is a good one, Josh. I got, I got do you Austin. take the elevator? I do not. Well, I mean, if it's like a 70-story building, yes, I will. Yeah. But here, on the third floor of our building, I take the stairs. I think I saw a video that... So the tallest building in the world, I think, is in the UAE. Mm -hmm. Will Smith did took the stairs oh, wow. on, in a video of that, and he went all the way to the top. Oh, and exhausting. it was incredible. Like, I mean, hundreds of stories oh, yeah. or something like that. So, woo. Is that the one that, and was it Mission Impossible or something, that Tom Cruise, like, repelled off the side of it? I've never seen those movies. I'm not allowed. They're too violent. Too violent. Too scary. Yeah. <laughs> So we have a couple more yep. scenarios just to be thinking about things that could happen. Yeah. Some of these are going to happen. If you give two options, yes. one of them is going to happen. Or like midterms. The, yes. elections, the elections are coming. It's going to happen. And there's midterm elections. <laughs> we don't know the outcome, but that's an example. So let's just start with that. Midterms. What are we okay. Doing? Yeah, so three options really, right? So right now, one thing that's not going to change is that we have a Democrat in the White House. Yes. They're not up for election. That's right? not up for election, so that will always remain. Yep. So then you have the two sides of Congress, yep. the House of Representatives and the Senate. Yep. As of now, the Democrats hold the majority in both of those. Mm -hmm. So you have a D, D, D. Democrat, Democrat, Democrat. Yep. The other option mm -hmm. is that there's three options, really. Both houses of Congress, the House of Representatives and the Senate, can yep. go to the Republicans. Yep. Okay? And this is one of those years where it's physically possible there are some years just by the number of seats available that you just Correct. can't even flip it. But this is a year where it could go that and way. And if you think about size of majorities, the Democrats' majority in both the House and the Senate, specifically the Senate, yeah. both of them quite small, yes. relatively speaking, to what they have been in the past for anyone. Mm -hmm. So it's very conceivable that at least one, if not both of them, flips. Yeah. And that's not an uncommon thing, thing to in happen the in a midterm yeah. election year because – People were all hooping and hollering for, I guess, the Democrats a couple years ago, and then things have changed, and maybe people are wanting a little bit more change, or a yeah. little bit to do things a little bit differently, and that's just the way it's working out this year. It could have been flipped the time before, but it's not uncommon for those to flip in a midterm election year. So the other options are, yes, both the House and the Senate go to the Republicans. Re Republicans could get a majority feasibly there, or you could have a mixture where you've got essentially gridlock, right? So the Senate could, could either one, remain yeah. Democratic and then the House flips Republican, or the Senate, Senate flips Republican and the House remains Democrat. Yep. And then the best case scenario for stocks is going to be gridlock. Gridlock is a good way to have not a ton of change go through. And when you're specifically thinking about things like tax increases and big social spending plans and all these kind of things, gridlock would be a very good thing for the economy that no big tax increases and stuff would go through. That being said, if both houses went Republican, you still have a Democratic president so that would not sign everything, mm -hmm. and there would most things would have a lot of compromise. So no matter what happens, we're going to have compromise. Yes. And even with how close they are right now, there's still compromise. pretty much gridlock as yeah. is. Yeah. So, all right. COVID, that's here, still around. We mentioned what China's doing. Everyone has but, it. Yeah. yeah. What do we? What do you got thoughts on that for the? Uh, I mean, there's two. There's two ways it can go, right? Or three, I guess. Yep. What if it's? What if Omicron is essentially the last major variant? It affects it infects enough people that 
people get natural immunity and because it's everywhere mm -hmm. and then we don't you know people are pretty much immune to it for a while anyway that's one option you know we kind of move past this we can pretty much move past COVID and the, the responses that we've had to do not just as the U.S. but as a world that's very bullish for a lot of things mm -hmm. bullish for yields because yep. the economic growth situation would be fine which is bullish for what we talked about earlier the financials the companies the pricing power all of those sort of things maybe not necessarily it's, it's more bullish for the reopening side of the trade, if you think of things like energy, you think of things like travel, mm -hmm. those kind of things would do better in that scenario. But if another more deadly variant arrives, option B, you're going the other way. You're going to slow things back down. Yields are going to go down. It's better for tech stocks and growth stocks. So that's kind of two sides of the coin there. The third and more likely option is that you're going to have something in the middle where we're still going to be dealing with this for a little bit of time and you're going to want to have a balance. And I think that's going to be the key that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Yep. All right. So with that, that has a big impact on the U.S. economy. Yep. And so if the U.S. economy growth either slows down or picks up, and that's usually measured by GDP, yep. the gross domestic product. But what do you got on those two scenarios? The U.S. economy either growing quickly right. or slowing down or being... Yeah. Upset. So if growth picks up, that's a good thing for yields. Optimism is going to be high. People are going to be, you know, more optimistic about the stock side of things in terms of so yields going up is bad for bonds. Stocks can still do well in a yield rising environment, despite what people say. But again, some of those higher yield areas of the market are going to be more attractive. Some of the more cyclical, the oil, the energy, the financial side of things that take huge swings in economic cycles, those may still have a ways to run in that scenario. But on the flip side, if, it, if growth slows, you know, maybe we got a lot of this, this whole economic cycle could have been compressed and maybe we got three quarters of it in two years. We don't know. Not every cycle has to be yep. 10, 20 years. Yep. So it could be a little bit shorter and we could see that growth really drop off. Uh, another thing that could happen, and I guess I didn't even put a note to talk about it, but the Fed. Mm -hmm. The Fed is going to have a huge impact on this year in general. Yep. The Fed could really turn things around quickly in a bad way. They could have what's called policy error, where they are trying to react very quickly and swiftly and aggressively to slow inflation, which we talked about earlier. And what they could do is, you know, they're going to taper off their QE, in and sense. then they're going to increase interest rates really quickly. And what they could do is essentially force us into a short-term recession mm -hmm. to because of all of the, like, it's essentially like we've we've addicted our economy and our markets to free and easy money, right? Yep. And if you, you have to wean it off, or else you're going to have a shock. A shock. Yeah. And we don't necessarily want that. Uh, we, along with that, the Fed in general. So obviously they've told us they're going to be weaning off QE by the end of quarter one. Essentially, is where that the bond purchases are going to be tapered off. So that's part A. We could feasibly see they're saying at least three rate hikes in 2022, and that's going to in increase interest rates as well. A quarter percent up, like Correct. that word. And that's, so that's three 25 basis points, or a quarter percent increases at least. So that could be four. I even heard Jamie Dimon, so CEO of JP Morgan, kind of knows what he's talking about, yeah. saying he could see as much as seven wow. interest rate increases. Do you even meet that often? That, they do monthly. Yeah. But that would actually, that would something like that would cause some, some serious market turmoil, because... Mm -hmm. The market is pricing in north of three, three and three to four in their range. If you get more than that, then you're going to start having some some, some serious revaluations of what's going on there. Okay. And then finally, let's look at corporate tax rates. Yeah. So so the Build Back Better agenda is really what is driving discussion on this. It's the answer of how do we pay for two trillion dollars of social spending and infrastructure plan, right? So the answer was, generally speaking, tax increases. Yep. That's the lever that politicians have. A lot of the, a lot of the individual tax side of things have pretty much been tabled for now. There's not a ton of discussion on what on the on major changes for that. There's obviously always going to be from the far left some discussions on you know wealth taxes mm -hmm. and if that's a wise thing to get them to pay their quote unquote fair share, which no one can ever define. Right. <laughs> but the same kind of discussion goes for corporate tax raises, corporate tax increases. So corporate taxes are another way to get those greedy corporations, I'm using air quotes, yeah. to pay their fair share, air quotes again, because no one can define what a fair share is. Or what a greedy corporation is. 
or what a 3D corporation, because they're just abiding by the laws that you've already put in place, right? So what tax rate increase would do is, just like interest rate increases, is it's also going to lower earnings, not just now, but even in the future. Because yeah. you're which, adding a cost. Because you're adding a cost, which is going to make stocks really essentially worth less, mm-hmm. or make companies have to find ways to offset that increase mm-hmm. somewhere else. Yep. So that's not necessarily a good thing. That could cause people to lay off employees, and we're already in we're in an improving but not perfect labor environment. So I just don't think that's necessarily the wisest thing. But that would put pressure on valuations of yeah. stocks. Okay. There's not going to be a corporate tax rate decrease. You know, we're already at a pretty we're more, we're in the very middle of the road. So we're at a corporate tax rate in the U.S. 21%. Right. Mm-hmm. 21% is middle of the road globally speaking, and it's a it. it it makes the U.S. an attractive place to do business, but still raise enough money to fund a country, right? Yeah. We're not zero, zero corporate income taxes like other countries. We're not 40% corporate in- income taxes like some other countries. We're right in the middle. And we always want the United States to be an attractive place to do business. Yep. That's just, that way that helps our country grow. Yep, so there's a fine balance of paying for things we want to pay for and the right way to do that. Yeah. So yeah, there's no really good answer for for tax rate increases. There isn't. I, I think that less is on the table than there was than there was last year. Yeah. So if you sat us down last year in 2021 and said, okay, Austin and Josh, are we going to get a tax rate in 2022? I would have said it seemed likely from a corporate tax rate increase, but that the very slim majority, specifically in the Senate, Joe Manchin is the guy who's coming to my mind here. Yeah. He's he he's holding up his, the, he's holding up the show yeah. in terms of build back better agenda, which is causing things like the more progressive policies, tax rate increases, and things like that to be shelved, mm-hmm. so that it can be a passable bill because he is needed to pass it. Yeah. Now it's things are even more unusual and uncertain in a midterm year because you want to do things to fulfill your things that you said you were going to do when you ran last time, yeah. but you don't want to do anything too aggressive that is going to make people not vote for you either. Mm-hmm. So kind politicians that. that are running for re-election right now are trying to dance across the line a little bit right now. Yeah. So that is, I mean, what did I say? I said I don't know what's going to happen at all yeah. because we have no idea what's going to happen in yeah. three months, six months, 12 months, Tomorrow. a couple years. We know that over time, long time periods, the U.S. economy and therefore the, the companies in, that, in the stock market are going to do well and yeah. grow over time. But in the short term, we have no idea what's going to happen. So, Josh, the question is, this boils down to, how do you build a dang bulletproof 2022 perfect portfolio? Well, very simple. There's a couple things you need to keep in mind. Okay. And this is really everything you've been saying. You've been giving the underlying arguments for this. Yeah. And giving scenarios and how you can tweak a portfolio made to optimize it through different scenarios. But high level is... You need to be diversified. Diversified. You need diversification. And all that means is just spreading yourself out among multiple different things that react in different ways. Yep. If they all move the same direction, you are not diversified. <laughs> right. And so diversify is huge because no matter what happens, you'll have something that'll do well and you'll have something that'll probably struggle. Yeah. It's a good portfolio. And, and what is one way to do that? Well, that is investing in all of the different things we talked about. Mm-hmm. So you need to invest in growth stocks and value stocks and small cap stocks and international stocks and emerging market stocks. And if your risk tolerance requires it, which is a big asterisk because I'm not super into into it, if your risk tolerance requires it, even boring bonds. Yep. So and because alternatives like real estate. Yes. You know, because what happens is if you do what's called dollar cost averaging. Dollar cost if averaging. you're investing all the time consistently, yep. so you're putting in a, you've got a portfolio of all those things I just mentioned, yep. right? And just hypothetically say they're all 10%, right? Mm-hmm. You're putting in $1,000 a month or whatever. Well, you're putting $100 a month into each of those things. Or, so you're buying more of things when they're less expensive yep. and less of things when they're more expensive. And eventually, it's right. going to smooth your returns. Oh, yeah. And it's going to make you diversified over time. Now, the key there is to rebalance. Rebalance. So that's that's also a key. So ever periodic. So what would your recommendation for Rebalance, Rebalance as often as you need to to stay in line with your plan. And so there's, you know, a lot of times I wouldn't do it more than monthly. I like quarterly or somewhere right in that range yeah. because monthly is even, 
depending on what your costs are too. Like if you're in a taxable account, you're going to create some gains. You may want to just spread that out right. a little bit more. But uh, in general, you know, periodic scheduled rebalancing. So at you're not trying to time annually. the market. Yeah, at least annually. But you know, quarterly, semi-annually, something along the line, just to keep you in line and in balance. I mean, if you're averaging over that time, dollar cost averaging, like we talked about, you won't hardly have to rebound. It'll help smooth that out anyways. I mentioned sticking with the plan. This is the key. The portfolio and your allocation there is one piece of it. But having a plan for your overall financial picture is huge. It allows you a reason to stick with what you're doing. You have a reason to do what you're doing. You're not just throwing darts at a board and hoping you get it right. And then to have a plan, a lot of times working with an advisor. And so, you know, here at Hanks and Zerker, where we both work, you know, we spend a lot of time with that. But wherever you have a financial advisor, making sure that together you agree on a plan and then you set up the best way to help you achieve that. So it's all about sticking with the yeah. plan. So as always, check out our free gift to you. It's a brief list of eight principles of timeless investing. These are overarching investment themes meant to keep you on track to meet your long-term goals. And that's exactly what we're talking about today. Right. Diversify rebalance, dollar cost average, and stick to that plan. Check it out. It's free on our website. Josh, how can people help us grow this podcast? As always, make sure to subscribe. Every Thursday, you get a new episode sent directly to you. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts. If you have any questions, thoughts, concerns, shoot us an email at hello at investeddads.com. And then finally, if you know somebody who wanted to know how to build a perfect portfolio for 2022, share this episode. That's right. Well, until next week, have a great week. Thank you for listening to the Invested Dads podcast. This episode has ended, but your journey towards a better financial future doesn't have to. Head over to theinvesteddads.com to access all the links and resources mentioned in today's show. If you enjoyed this episode and we had a positive impact on your life, leave us a review. Click subscribe and don't miss the next episode. Josh Robb and Austin Wilson work for Hicks and Zerker Capital Management. All opinions expressed by Josh, Austin, or any podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Hicks and Zerker Capital Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. Clients of Hicks and Zerker Capital Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. There is no guarantee that the statements, opinions, or forecasts provided herein will prove to be correct. Past performance may not be indicative of future results. Indices are not available for direct investment. Any investor who attempts to mimic the performance of an index would incur fees and expenses, which would reduce returns. Securities investing involves risk, including the potential for loss of principal. There is no assurance that any investment plan or strategy will be successful.